It will surprise you if I tell you that for me it's much easier to explain to you what death is than to explain what life is. Uh, death is the presence of certain signs which indicate to the doctor that that individual is dead. And it's the same for all individuals. But life differs from individual to individual. What do you mean when you say I'm alive? What do I mean when I say I'm alive? Life is the joy of living. It's the celebration of being alive. At about half past three on a warm Saturday afternoon, a mother and her daughter had just purchased a cake in a bakery on Cape Town's main road in Salt River. As they crossed that street, a drunk driver skipped the traffic light and hit them both. Mrs. Darvell lay dead, killed instantly, and close by her daughter Denise, all but 25 years of age, lay fatally injured. Let us pause. Pause to remember and honour the extraordinary heroism, sacrifice and generosity of spirit of Edward Darvell, Denise's father, all those years ago. Denise was transported in an ambulance to Krituskia Hospital a few kilometers away and was declared brain dead. Later that day, her father was told by the attending doctors that Denise was on life support and there was nothing more they could do for her. One of their doctors, Dr. Bertie Bossman said, we can't save your daughter. Her injuries are just too bad. But I tell you, we have a man in the hospital here and we can save his life if you give us permission to use your daughter's heart and her kidney. Her heart was intended for Louis Washkansky, a 53-year-old man dying of heart failure in the hospital, and her kidney would later save the life of a 10-year-old Jonathan van Veik. In the midst of his unimaginable grief, Edward Darvell recounted making his decision. He said this, I remembered a birthday cake she had made for me with a heart in it and the words, Daddy, we love you. I remembered too a bathrobe she bought me with her first week's salary from the bank. And I thought, she was always giving, always like that, giving away things to other people. So I decided that she would have said yes to Dr. Bosman if he had asked her instead of me. For the staff and doctors at Kruteskir Hospital, it started off as an ordinary Saturday. My housemate had a birthday party and we were at the party. I'd spent the day out um, training at my water skiing for a competition and I was going to go off again at 6 o'clock on Sunday morning. This was the night that history would be made. The night that put South Africa and Dr. Christian Barnard on the world stage. Uh, you must remember that we had already practiced heart surgery for nine years at Khrushchev Hospital before we did the first transplant. So we went ahead having practiced the operation quite extensively and we knew we could do it. The, 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 there were two, two issues that we had to clear. The one was firstly, what type of patient would we operate on as the first patient for the transplant. And I discussed this with my cardiologist, Dr. Val Schreire, and we decided it would be a terminally ill patient where all medical uh, treatment have failed and where we could not perform a more straightforward surgical operation on the patient. So we chose Mr. Washkansky, who was in a terminal state of heart failure. The second was, what did the law say about donation of organs? You see, the, 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 the thing that amazed me is that both kidney transplantation and liver transplantation preceded cardiac transplant, heart transplantation. And the donor of the heart was managed exactly the same. But nobody asked questions when liver and kidney transplants were performed. It's only when the heart was transplanted that all the questions were raised. Uh, where, the, where the doctor's capability of diagnosing the moment of death was queried. But we looked at the law, and the law of South Africa, I must say, the, the Nationalist Party didn't make many good laws, but as far as human donation was concerned, it was a very modern law, in that they stated that a patient could be, or an individual could be considered a donor, when two doctors, one being qualified for more than five years, declared him dead. 
Now it's interesting, they didn't say how, they didn't try and define how the doctors must declare that individual dead. And therefore we were able to use the moment of brain death. We got the phone call at about half past nine to come into a hospital. The night of the operation, I was staying with my cousin and my auntie Anne, and um, she came to us and said, look, I have to go to Boba and Zayda. Uncle Louis is going to get a new heart. I don't know what she was talking about. It was, you know, I was 16, but I still couldn't comprehend what she meant by a new heart. We, we knew he was in hospital, we visited him, etc. Always, every weekend. Um, but she had to get permission from her parents to make sure that it was okay for him to get a new heart. And about nine o'clock the phone rang and I said to my mom, mom, this is it, I must go to hospital now. At Rutsky Hospital, I was a consultant there, um, but I did mostly ear, nose and throat work. I specialized in that, whereas Dr. Zinsky was the cardiac anesthetist and there was only one of them and he was the one. So the highly specialized part of anesthesia and not everybody was allowed to do it. And he phoned me on a Saturday night at about midnight and said to me, would I come up to the hospital? I was on call for the rest of the hospital. And I said, yes. I said, well, what are you, what are you going to do? So he said, uh, a heart transplant. I said, what? I actually fell out of my bed. My wife said to me, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I mean, this guy's telling me that I've got to come and help with a heart transplant. When Mr. Daval said that we could have his daughter's heart, I was a little anxious, you know, thinking, well, maybe, maybe it would have been better if he said no, then I still have some time to think about the business. But um, I was relieved when we had a donor and we were able to help Louis Waskanski because he was seriously ill at that stage. I went to, went to nine o'clock to the hospital, got the room ready for uh, Louis Waskanski. Then I went and watched the op. I was instructed uh, to look after the donor, Denise Darvel. I was the same age as Denise Darvel when we did the transplant. But she was brain dead. And um, once the two doctors have certified that this was the case, she was classified as a potential donor and her father gave permission to, uh, for her to be a donor. But Louis was quite amazing to take a chance. He was actually the right candidate. Coincidence perhaps, I don't know. But that dreadful accident and he, he was there, you know. It's quite amazing. When Dini and I went to fetch the the heart lung machine, we had to go through the doctor's chains rooms. And when we got to the second chains room, Professor Barnard was sitting in the chains room, in a chair, and we stopped because we didn't know whether we could go through. And he said, now you can go through. And he said in his book that at that moment when he was sitting there, he was contemplating whether he should go ahead with the operation or not. And when he saw Dini and myself being so determined to get the heart lung machine, he went into shower and he thought he will do the operation. It was actually very quiet in the theatre. Everybody was just preparing, getting everything ready. But you could sense that there was an air of expectancy that something extraordinary was going to happen. There was a lot of expectations rather than um, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? Prof Barnard went through to the donor theatre to excise Denise's heart and um, Marius and uh, Terry O'Donovan were all ready to connect her up to the heart-lung machine as soon as her own heart had stopped beating because um, Chris wouldn't let them put the scalpel to the chest until they switched off the uh, respirator and the heart stopped beating on its own for the first transplant. We were ready to go on bypass. Professor Barnard went across to the donor theatre and he took the heart out and brought it over to the recipient theatre. People believed that it was a great exciting day for me, full of tension. It was not such a big deal. It was another heart operation. The only time that I realized that I was doing something different, and this was really the moment of truth, 
is when I looked down into the chest of that patient and there was no heart. I'd seen many open chests, but I've always seen a heart there. And this is the first time that I saw a living human being without a heart. He excised Wojcicki's heart and he immediately started um, sewing in the new heart. And you cannot imagine the moment how lonely I was at that moment. Because there was nobody I could turn to and say, listen, am I doing the right thing? What must I do next? The next point was where I was worried. Would the heart start beating again once I supply it now with warm blood from the heart and machine? And as soon as the heart um, was perfused with warm, oxygenated blood, it started quivering with life. Christian said, yes, it can work. And when the blood came back into that transplant heart, immediately it showed life. And eventually when I shocked it, it started beating. And, and it was like, if, as if there was a darkness in that operating room. And when the heart started beating, light came on again. And everybody started talking and everybody was, was He left the theatre and Peggy O'Down also left the theatre and I had to help with the closing up. And uh, when I left that hospital that morning, you'll be surprised to know there was not one photographer, not one uh, television camera, not one newspaper reporter outside that hospital to interview me about the operation. But uh, as history has shown, things changed very rapidly after that. He was awake right from as soon as he came back from the theatre, a little bit groggy, but he was fine and knew where we were, knew who we were, and we just looked after him, nursed him, and then bit by bit as he got better, we could take the oxygen tent off. He says, I'm alive, I'm alive. We said, yes, you are. The hospital phoned, they want you in uniform at the hospital at six o'clock. So we had no idea, I had no idea why I had to be there. So when we got there, the Cape Times was there, and the Burger was there, and the Argus, and everybody was there. And we then realized we had done something special. I had phone calls from all over the world. And that evening, there was a television crew here uh, to photograph the team and to discuss the operation with the team. And then after that, it just became impossible to work. I, I recognize what they wanted, but what I don't think they recognize is the need that I had to have time to look after my patients, to do my surgery, and that I couldn't spend all the time answering questions and appearing in front of cameras. Because I tried very hard to stop him from having it. He couldn't wait to have it done, and, and he really thought this man was a, a genius. He used to call him in, in uh, he used to say it in Yiddish, with a golden hand, with a golden hands, and this is what he referred to him all the time. He looked upon him as a god. It was amazing to see how he lost all evidence of heart failure. The swelling of his legs disappeared, the swelling of his liver disappeared, his lungs became dry, and he was well, mentally well, and I really did not believe that it will not be successful. So we were very optimistic at the beginning, in the first uh, week or so. I was very apprehensive, because I thought his personality might have changed not realizing that the, the heart is not the person, it's your brain that, that makes the person. And I was ha happy to see it was the same Louis, you know, and he was hooked up to people all over the world, talking to people in London and New York. I was lucky enough to get a second chance, which very few people do. I was completely destroyed that morning. I went down to my office and I lay on the couch there. Um, and one of my laboratory assistants came in and he saw I was crying because he was a very likable man, Mr. Woskansky. He was a very nice man. There was great sorrow that uh, we let him down. We kind of had a tough time, he, me and the kids. And you used to come home from work, I used to come home from work and I used to see things in the kitchen, boxes, you know. Who can it be? Can only be Uncle Louie. You try to thank him, what am I talking about? I was never at your home. Everything anonymous. He was generous to community, to people, and definitely to us. It was, it was horrible. We just didn't 
we didn't expect it, but you know, as things started to sort of not be right, you realise maybe this is not going to, yeah, he's not going to get better. The doctor, they were really in tears, Barnard himself. And they, they, you know, they couldn't believe that he was actually dying. Barnard was the guy who started intensive care. Intensive care didn't exist before Barnard. There's no doubt in my mind that he was the father of intensive care or the concept of intensive management after any major operation. I cannot tell you why the first heart transplant was done in South Africa, but I can tell you why it was possible to do the first heart transplant in South Africa. And it was possible because of the excellent training that we have here and the high standard of medicine that was practiced in South Africa. I remember very well in those days it was, you know, apartheid days and they had a special intensive care unit for coloured and black people and one for white people and he said no, he's going to have one intensive care unit where the best nurses will nurse and the best and the patients will all lie there in that intensive care unit. Chris Barnard turned around and said he was not having two intensive care units. He was going to have one and he was going to have one ward for people. I came to Cape Town to look for work because my family was very poor. I couldn't manage to go to school. I take standard six. Now from standard six I came here to work to the gardener. And he worked as the gardener for six years there. And then he heard there was, uh, uh, there was a position at the animal house at the medical school. Anyhow, he started working there and um, he was not satisfied just to clean the cages of the animals. He wanted more than that and gradually worked himself up and worked himself into the laboratory where we were doing um, experimental work on animals, doing heart transplants. And uh, I could see that he was a very capable young man and uh, I gave him do more and more and more and eventually he could do a heart transplant, sometimes better than the junior doctor who came there. And they eventually moved away from me and went into the laboratory where they did liver transplants. Now, liver transplant really is a very difficult surgical procedure. And he learned this too, in that he, today he can do heart transplant and he can do liver transplant. I can't do liver transplant, but he can. And Chris said to me, phone the airlines and book an air ticket for Hamilton to East London. And he said, I'll pay for it. And Hamilton had never been in an aeroplane before. And it happened that his wife was going to have a baby and he wanted to go to the Eastern Cape to be there. So off he went to East London and his wife gave birth to a son and Hamilton called him Barnard. So many people with tremendous potential uh, has never had the opportunity to develop that potential. I always say the ingredients to success is firstly a certain amount of ability and the second one is opportunity. Uh, and many, there are many, many people who are probably as skilled as Hamilton, as gifted as Hamilton, that has never had the opportunity to explore what God gave them. Before my father became famous, I had quite a good name, <laughs> Deirdre Barnard, and I was a water skier, Springbok water skier, and the very, I got my Springbok colors when I was very young, 12. And um, then everybody used to, when we walked around, everybody says, oh, look, there's Deirdre Barnard's father. And then when he became famous, I became Professor Barnard's daughter. And don't think I don't use that. And when I was in America, I worked in America, in New York, I go to a medical meeting, okay, and Owen Wagenstein is the presenter there. So I'm standing there, I'm now Mr. Nobody. And this man comes up behind me and he touches me on my shoulder. And as I turn around, it's Owen Wagenstein. He says, where do you come from? I come from South Africa. He says, I thought so. You talk just like Chris Barnard. He said, Chris Barnard was the best registrar who ever passed through my department in all my years at University of Minnesota. That was Owen Wagenstein, out of the blue, telling me that Chris Barnard was the best registrar who ever passed through his department. He was unique in that he would do an operation. For example, his day for operating on children every week was on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, he would do the operation on a Tuesday and then he would stay with that child right through the night at the bedside, not sleeping or not at another place. He was at the bedside for 24 hours. He had great compassion for people and he always wanted to help. 
and he, would, he never turned anybody away. I always felt if I had a problem I could go and talk to him. He always tried his best to help you and he was very compassionate towards his patients. I always had the greatest respect for Christian Barnard because of his technique, the way he operated, but also for his empathy with all his patients. And he had a lot of passion for his patients and he used to get quite emotional if he lost a patient. I think he was way ahead of his peers and he was interested in congenital heart surgery and that may well have been a connection that we had and why we became friends in his later life. I carried my resignation letter in my pocket starting about two weeks after I joined his unit because it was such a stressful uh, unit. and. Um, I carried it for about a year and then left it at home. And then the one day he actually screamed in my ear so much I got a sore ear. <laughs> and he, I wasn't the person he was screaming at. And then I thought to myself, no, I, I, you know, I'd rather leave. And anyway, in the morning I gave him my uh, resignation letter at the end of the ward round. Ward rounds were you had to be absolutely on your toes with every one of the patients. And um, anyway, at the end, I gave him my resignation letter and he walked off and he came back in the evening and I thought he would be screaming at me and rude to me because somebody else had handed their resignation letter in about four months before and he had really been very rude to them. I was a difficult person to work with because I opened up all the time. I didn't keep it inside me. And that is why I'm not going to die from heart disease, you see, from a heart attack, because I explode it all the time. Those people that keep it inside them and build up the tension inside them, those are the people who get heart attacks. And at the end of the ward run, he said, by the way, Des, and that was the first time he called me by my name. He always called me Dr. Ferreira. <laughs> and then he said, by the way, Des, come, come along here. And uh, uh, we were walking along, and then I don't, he, he said, oh, I got your letter, and he started to speak to me. And all I remember is he was so charming that uh, I watched him walking away, echoing in my mind, yes, don't worry, I'll work for you for another six months. And the other thing that uh, really impressed me about him was that he's one of the very few surgeons I've ever worked with or met who could operate and think at the same time. Most surgeons, if they encounter something that they don't expect, they stop and they think and they plan. He had the ability to just move through it. Most surgeons know a lot about surgery, but Chris had learned a lot about anesthesia there. He learned a lot about pumping. He learned about ventilation. And often when he was working, when he, when he felt something was wrong, he was able to spot it very early and he would say, have another look at that. And Dr. Oz would say, no, everything's okay. And he said, no, everything's not okay. And often your doctor, Dr. Chris would be correct. So he had a very generalized information of cardiac, cardiac anesthesia and cardiac surgery. I met Professor Chris Barnett on a few occasions. And uh, I was always impressed how he was still up to date with the latest developments. And Barnard had a tremor. And it was a tremor which somebody who didn't know him Look from the outside would say, oh, this guy's, you know, he's, he's, yeah. But I promise you, I will demonstrate to you Barnard's tremor now, okay? This is Barnard's tremor, okay, just like that. And then when it comes to him putting the stitch in, it stops. Puts the stitch in. Yeah. He never, ever put a stitch in that wasn't perfect. Never. Doctor, I'm told you have arthritis. When did you first notice this? Well, I think it during the period when I was working so many hours. Uh, I, I actually, in those days, I started to do some ice skating. I'd never done it before, but the kids loved it, so I used to take them down to do ice skating, and I developed a pain in my foot, and I thought it was from skating, and then eventually my hands started, my feet started. I went then to see a doctor, and can you imagine, he said to me, you know, you've got rheumatoid arthritis. And I thought to myself, I just pictured the patients that I've seen with the hands like this, the rheumatoid arthritis, and I thought to myself, God, am I, is that going to be my life? Here I am ready to become a heart surgeon and I'm going to end up like that. But he said something, and this also taught me, 
He said something, he said, you know, you are what we call serum negative, and it will never be so bad that you will become crippled from it. And he was correct. And that's why I learned something there, that even if you have to give a patient bad news, always put a bright side to it. Never totally, totally destroy a patient by giving him the news of his illness. There must always be hope, because when there's hope, there's that fight for life. And that hope that he gave me, that I will never become crippled, carried me through my whole surgical career. When I think of my father, I always think back on one of his favorite poems, and it says, Is it not strange that princes and kings, and clowns that kept in sawdust strings, and common people like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mess, a book of rules, from which, as time does pass, to build a stepping stone or stumbling block. I think my father used his shapeless mess he used his bag of tools. Occasionally he looked at the book of rules. But he definitely created many stepping stones.